Wow, it's so silent here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Urs Gasser. Um, I'm with the Berkman Klein Center. And as you can see, uh, Urs Gasser has a big smile on his face tonight. Uh, I couldn't be happier to welcome all of you uh, to this official launch of a truly wonderful book, Safe Spaces, Brave Spaces, by our amazing um, colleague, collaborator, and dear friend, John Palfrey, head of school at Phillips Academy in Landover. Um, I won't go through his full CV, it's well known. Uh, it's more like a coming home for you, John. Thank Certainly you. that's the way it feels for us. Um, but I would say, uh, someone wrote on John's Facebook wall um, newsfeed uh, earlier today. And I thought uh, what this person wrote captures it very well. And uh, the quote is, John is a voice of calm and reason in a crazy world. <laughs> and indeed, I can't think of anyone better uh, to write this book, a book that helps us as individuals, as educators, as society at large, to navigate through a question which is how can we renew, but also reconcile our commitment both to diversity and inclusion, as well as free expression. I trust tonight we will have a far-ranging debate about these issues, of course also considering the current political environment, crazy world indeed, but I also believe it's brilliant, as John does in this book, to start the conversation by reflecting on what's happening on our campuses here, but also across uh, the world. Uh, as academic institutions uh, are, in a way, seismographs of what's happening in society at large, but also in some ways a laboratory for how we can shape our society in the future. And I believe, John, in this book you really provide a roadmap how our future uh, could look like, and I'm uh, personally very grateful for, for the vision you present uh, in this book. Uh, we are very fortunate not only to have John here uh, tonight, it's actually a little bit of a reunion uh, in many ways. Uh, we have uh, a number of friends and colleagues uh, from Andover. We have also students from Andover, as well as from Harvard College, who will be uh, in conversation uh, with John tonight. Uh, so it will be very interactive, and we're uh, looking forward to a fun uh, discussion. Also, of course, a series a discussion, but we'll make it fun uh, as, as always. Um, this session is live streamed, uh, so uh, please be aware uh, as you introduce yourself or as you have questions or comments. Um, what is not live streamed is the reception that follows after uh, the session to which you're all invited who are here uh, together uh, tonight. So with that, I uh, want to turn over to my great friend, John, uh, for his talk. And uh, let me congratulate you to this really amazing book, my friend. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. You are all very kind to come here tonight, and thank you to anyone on the live stream uh, who is also watching or, or people after the fact watching this session. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It is indeed a coming home. Uh, I've taught in this very classroom. You didn't know that, but to be in 1023 is, uh, is a wonderful thing. Uh, it's also just a great combination of friends who I see here and, and friends who have been willing to put this event together. I will admit I'm one of those authors a bit ambivalent about having book talks of any sort because the focus is inevitably on the person who wrote it. Um, but I'm very grateful that we do this in a collaborative style as we do today. Uh, and the hosts are three tonight. One is of course, the Berkman Klein Center, and uh, Urs, as the executive director, thank you for uh, your leadership, and Alba Hancock, who did so much work putting the event together. Uh, second host is the Harvard Law School Library, another former home of mine, and I see some former HLS library uh, staff here. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, and third, our friends at Andover, uh, the Tang Institute, and uh, many of our uh, current students and others are here. Um, Caroline Nolan and uh, Eric Rowland, thank you for your help in putting this together. So the combination of these institutions, I'm very grateful that, that uh, you've come together for this event. 
I thought I would start briefly talking about the thought process behind the book uh, and the argument behind it. And then I want to talk briefly about the format of the book. And I'm very grateful that uh, our colleagues from MIT Press are here. Um, we have uh, created an open access version, which is behind me. And I want to talk about that briefly. And then what I'm going to do is actually open it up to a group of students who have looked at the book, maybe even read the whole book, um, which is, combines some students who are currently at Andover and some uh, students who are currently at Harvard, uh, and look forward to their questions and comments and critiques. And I have encouraged them already to challenge me, and I hope that they will do that. Um, and then we will have uh, an open discussion after that, if that makes sense. Um, the basic argument of the book is really, really simple. It is that I believe we should find a way in both our academic settings and in the republic at large to find a balance between diversity and free expression. My sense is that both of these things are crucially important to a republic, and they are crucially important to a learning environment. And my experience as someone who has been in an administrative role uh, in a college and, and, and law school and in the context of, uh, of, a, of a high school is that very often in the last several years we have pitted the two against one another. In other words, you either are on the left and you favor diversity and equity and inclusion, or you're on the right and you favor free expression. And very often the debates get put in this way that pits the two against one another. And the argument that I advance in this book is that that is not ultimately constructive, that instead we should find a way that these two things, which I actually think ultimately do reinforce one another, um, and that we should find ways to embrace them. That is not to say that it is easy to do so. There are extremely hard cases, and I hope we'll talk about some of them tonight, which simply can't be reconciled in an easy way. I think hate speech is the most obvious one in the context um, particularly of our academic institutions, but also in society at large. I would say some examples around uh, sexual violence, um, particularly gender-based violence, would be another example where it's very, very hard to find uh, a reconciliation. And in those cases, we simply need some rules and some boundaries. Um, but ultimately, I think we are much better off if we find the common ground, the places where diversity on the one hand and free expression on the other, in fact, are reinforcing values. And I realize that um, this may sound old-fashioned in sort of an old-fashioned liberal way, um, but I think, in fact, that's true, and, and, and possibly in, in a really positive way. On the other hand, I would also say that one of the reasons I think we are having these debates is the young people, in their wisdom, have been advancing some concerns that we probably haven't been as responsive to as those of us who uh, maybe are old school liberals in, in one sense, uh, and that as we inform, as we improve our institutions, that we actually have to listen to those voices and to those debates, and that it does cause us, I think, to ask some hard questions about what we mean when we support free expression. And it may be that we actually need to change some of those rules in a variety of ways. And I think that's actually really worth listening to. So um, I do see some dynamism in this argument and one that, that ought to prompt us to take uh, hard looks uh, at these topics. So starting with the diversity side of the equation, uh, in the particular book I use the, Fisher, the, the device of the Fisher cases that are around affirmative action as making the case uh, for diversity. But of course, it's a broader thing than just the way the Supreme Court has seen it. I think our institutions can and should be deeply devoted to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We can talk about what we mean by those things. I think that our institutions have not been as supportive of these ideas as they should have been in the past. The history of elite institutions like Harvard, like Andover, like many that we've worked at have been stories of exclusion for far too long. I think we are getting much better at it. I think we are better at acknowledging the effects of structural and systemic racism as an example. Um, but I don't think that we are at a place where we can yet say that work is actually done. And in fact, we need to keep pressing on it in a variety of ways. And that's a hugely important, uh, hugely important statement. And I will be interested in the students' perspectives on the progress or the lack of progress that we've made in those ways in these institutions. Um, I also think that in some ways the diversity, diversity argument pushes us toward a proper examination of the debate around safe spaces. And part of the title here is uh, Safe Spaces. Uh, one of the arguments that I think pops into the press a lot around this topic is the notion that um, we should or shouldn't create safe spaces for students. In this book, I argue that we absolutely should in the context of universities and schools and perhaps more broadly in society. I favor safe spaces in a very specific way, but I think it is a heuristic for thinking more broadly about how we support our students. 
I think safe spaces are crucial in the same way that every human being needs a place that they can come to, like a kitchen, for instance, in a home, where they're surrounded by people who support them and love them, where you can say something really stupid and you know it won't get out, it will not be recorded. And I do hope in the spirit of the Berkman Klein Center we talk a little bit about the effects of social media and how this has affected this debate. But I think we all need spaces where we can come and where we are supported by people who love us and know us and where there are ground rules, whether they're explicit or they are are, uh, or they're implicit, um, whether they're something that's written down or they're just understood by all of us, and it's a zone of comfort for us. In the context of a school or a university, I think a safe space might look like a Hillel, for instance, here at, on the Harvard campus. It might be an LGBTQ group. There might be a space where people actually often come to, or it might be um, a, a virtual space where people know they can come. But I think these safe spaces are essential for us. It might be a group uh, or an environment where students who have been uh, subjected to sexual violence, survivors of sexual violence might come together. They would know that there were certain things that wouldn't be said or done to them that would have certain triggering effects in that environment. I think we owe it to our students, in fact, to have safe spaces of those sorts. At the same time, I make the argument that we should also, in the context of a learning environment, have what are brave spaces for our students. And by brave spaces, I think of this space, a classroom space perhaps. I think of the outdoor spaces that one might walk through on a campus where you might be subjected to people with placards and you might be subjected to people who are saying something that are, is less comfortable. So if a safe space is about primarily about ensuring a degree of comfort, uh, it actually is the case, I think, in other settings, educational settings, where students should be uncomfortable. There should be discomfort. Um, I acknowledge at the same time that these spaces might be experienced, or one might experience these spaces in different ways, depending where one uh, has come from. So to the extent that one comes from a place of enormous privilege, and you're the kind of person uh, as I am, where a family has been at a particular place, as my mom is here, and she's uh, went to this very college before I did, and she's on the faculty here. So for me, to be a student here and a faculty member here, um, I have a sense of real safety, and I have a sense of real confidence for other people who might not be, might be the first generation to college, might feel marginalized in a variety of ways, you might experience different spaces in different ways. And I think it's important to acknowledge that different students have different pathways through these safe and brave spaces that we create. At the same time, I do make the argument that I think all students ought to have some combination of these spaces in the context of their education. Um, so that's uh, really the, the, the core of the argument. Um, I would love to uh, get to some of the specific hard cases that have come up in the, in the last several years. The examples that I use in the context of the book include trigger warnings, they include safe spaces, they include the debates over campus symbols that have been moved or changed over time, they include the disinvitation of speakers, they include the way in which we respond to claims around sexual harassment and sexual assault and so forth. So all of those things, which are, I think, incredibly hard sometimes to navigate, um, seem to call out for a series of principles and a series of rules that we, as schools and as, as communities, adopt and bring forward. Um, in my book, I argue that it might be different the way that different schools approach this kind of thing. So we have some colleagues here from Gann Academy, which is a, um, a Jewish day school here in Boston. I run a school, uh, Andover, that is also a, a private school, um, same age kids to some degree, but a Jewish school might actually take a very different view on certain aspects of this work than a school that was founded 240 years ago in the Calvinist tradition. Um, and I actually think that's okay. I think it is totally appropriate that we might have heterodoxy in that sense in terms of how we approach these things. It's also obviously the case in the context of state institutions. The First Amendment has a particular role to play, which is less strong, not irrelevant, but less strong um, than in private institutions. Um, and so one thing I argue for is that it actually may be a good thing that different schools have different approaches to uh, this topic. And so long as we are clear with students as they come into our environment um, that that might be entirely appropriate um, uh, to have different sets of rules and different ways of navigating some of these very hard topics as they come about. Okay, so last point uh, before turning it over to the students and their thoughts is actually about the format of this book. Um, I very much hope that uh, as we move forward as a community that we find ways to share our knowledge in, in different formats and I'm very excited that the MIT Press has partnered with me in this particular way, which is to have an open access version of the book. Um, I hope that uh, anyone who has views on this, uh, even now during the session or afterwards, um, who wishes to disagree with the text, you have a great way to do it online. Um, it is up here, uh, it's bravespaces.org is the URL. 
Um, and I just wanted to, uh, to really acknowledge the great work that the Berkman Center uh, over time and the library and others who are supporting this event have done in terms of ensuring that we can have broad and public discourse on topics of this sort, and in particular to make the uh, kinds of arguments that take place in academic settings more broadly available. I think it is a hugely, hugely positive thing. Um, and several of our colleagues here have published books in a similar way. I see Yokai Benkler, who was one of the early open access publishers with his uh, famous book about uh, the wealth of networks. And I hope that uh, in the way in which this book is rolled out and, and others, that we continue to make the case for open access publishing as well as uh, the kind that is in this format, which is also a lovely and wonderful thing. Um, so let me pause there, and I'm going to turn over the, uh, the microphone, virtually anyway, to some students who have done some work on this. And then we will uh, open it up for, for questions more broadly. But uh, I think that the elder statesman of the group is from the Andover class of 2015 and the Harvard College class of 2019, which is uh, Devante Freeland. And Devante, if I might give you a microphone for the first comment slash question. Over to you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Really great to be able to be here and share some of my perspectives. Uh, as, I, as was said, I'm a, currently a junior at Harvard College. Um, and I graduated from Phillips Andover three years ago, two years ago, in, in 2015. Um, and so have thought about this text both in the context of my experience studying at Andover um, under John Palfrey's leadership and then also my time here at Harvard where I was confronted with even more so uh, a lot of the issues around safe spaces, what does it mean to invite a speaker, when or when should you not protest uh, a speaker. And so I have learned a lot about, about my own place and my own views around that. And so interacting with uh, this text has been really exciting for me. I think uh, the first thing that really stood out to me uh, was recognizing this either or fallacy that's presented between, between diversity and between free expression was an immediate first step for me um, and signaled for me as going through the rest of the text that this was something that I really wanted to grapple with because this was an insight that isn't being acknowledged in a lot of ways. I think if you were to just look in the New York Times at an opinion piece around uh, free discourse on college campuses, you just see a lot of straw men arguments being presented against each other. Uh, and so I'm excited to see some, some um, genuine reconstructions here. Uh, on the other side, I think if I went to a school for three years and 100% agreed with my high school principal, that would be also a red flag. Bring it on, Devante. Come on. <laughs> Absolutely. That would be a red flag. Um, and so I wanted to, to address uh, chapter five, which I think, um, if anything, is, is sort of the, the linchpin of the, the text in that it deals with some of the most uh, difficult to, to measure issues, which is hate speech. And there's a particular part of chapter five, uh, which presents this idea that uh, each, each institution, whether a secondary school or university, ought to, one, really assess its own values and its own principles in coming up with what its policy is around free speech and diversity, uh, and that those differing traditions should inform what type of policy that they, they come up with, and then that policy should be communicated clearly and transparently and held consistently. I entirely agree that it would be great if all institutions were consistent about what their values were to their students. But also, I would push back in the idea that I think this thought experiment that we're engaging in should be around what is a baseline set of values that we can establish across all of our, of our, of our country, across all of society, for how institutions ought to engage and interact, and what are the promises that a student um, should be able to expect that are held whenever they enter an institution, no matter what that institution is, rather than coming up with differing values and differing sets of systems and commitments to either diversity to some degree or to free expression to another degree across an institution. There is a particular set of paragraphs which um, present that uh, an institution like the University of Chicago might have a different set of values versus a, an historically black college or a Catholic university or a Jewish university, and that that was okay depending on the values of those institutions because of the unique history of a, a school like Howard or a school like Notre Dame versus U Chicago. And it feels to me that as a young person, um, we don't always sort of have every single option in the world around schools, whether it's in high school or it's in university, and that there should be, if anything, 
we should be using our energies as a culture towards establishing what is the very minimum baseline that a student ought to expect and the type of education we ought to receive across all institutions of higher learning. So not so much that I believe that the statements that were made in this chapter were false or don't mm. hold, but that if anything, we ought to really take that next step and actually line up. What is it that at every school should be at some baseline um, set of interactions around free expression and diversity? And I think that that would really be helpful to offer up to the world as we're all trying to, to figure this out. Um, in other ways, I think my um, experience here, actually having protested speakers who have come and being out a few weeks ago protesting Charles Murray, mm -hmm. who was here to, to speak about a book um, and brought by one campus group that in my opinion is particularly divisive and counterproductive, mm -hmm. um, I would love to also be able to um, have the opportunity to offer that to the discussion if it becomes relevant. Fabulous. Those we definitely thoughts. want to hear that for sure. Um, let me respond briefly because it's a it's a brilliant and important point, and then we'll we'll go around and hear some more comments. And I, I think, first of all, well struck. I think that is a, it's a great critique of that chapter, and I think it's a great critique overall of of my argument. Um, and obviously, moral relativism is not a good idea. Or I shouldn't say obviously, moral relativism is not a good idea in my view. So the the point is not that there should not be any bounds in terms of how we set these rules. Um, I think what I was trying to stress in a way, and I'd be very interested, those who run, for instance, a Jewish uh, institution, I don't know if anyone here happens to run any other type of institution that has a particular either a faith tradition or a, um, or a um, kind of a cultural tradition, is to say, I don't think that one size fits all in general and in, in educational settings, and that at the hardest kinds of cases, it seems to me reasonable that there might be sharper limits. But I guess what you point to, which I probably didn't do as well as I should have in the book, is to say that there ought to be some kind of baseline in terms of commitment, particularly around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that's a really, really good point. Um, I would love to see a higher baseline for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have tried over time with Andover to bring up that baseline. Um, it is a work in progress, as you know. You've experienced it um, as, a, as a student recently. Um, and I think that's right, that there should be there should be pressure in, in that direction. Um, one thing that I think I was reacting to in a way in, in crafting that particular chapter is that for in, in current jurisprudence, the idea that a state university presented with any of these challenges hews only to the First Amendment is one place where I actually I deviate from the, the, the standard view. And, and I make clear that I'm arguing something that probably is, or almost certainly is inconsistent with, with current law. Um, so an example that I think about is if a neo-Nazi group were to wish to organize an uh, event or whatever it is, some kind of a speech here on Cambridge Common, and they follow the set of strictures that the Supreme Court set out in the recent Skokie case, they probably could do that, right? There might be restrictions in various ways, but they probably could do it. If they came to Andover or a student group said they wanted to bring a neo-Nazi group, I would say no. And I would be totally, I'd be entirely supported in doing that under the law, in my view, particularly given what we've told students they can expect when they come to Andover. And I would feel totally right in, in doing so. Likewise, if a speaker were to come you know, who was, um, I don't know, praising um, sexual assault against women or something that is, might be protected in some settings but is completely antithetical to the values of our school, we would say no. An argument that I extend in this book is that I could see and a change to the current law that would say the First Amendment might not apply in every educational setting if the speech was such that it actually would detract from the educational experience of the students because it's so obnoxious. That would be a very hard line to draw. It would be a very hard law to craft. It would absolutely not fly for lots of people. And then plenty of people in this room would disagree with it. Um, but what I am trying to argue for in that setting is to say that we are rethinking, I think, the balance between these, these values. One is effectively equality, and one is effectively liberty. Um, and I could see changing the way in which we think about it in, in some schools. Even if we did that, you still might have a setting in which private schools with different viewpoints might adopt different sets of rules. And I think that's probably OK. But very well done. Thank you. Super nice. Piper, may we go to you and then come around this way? Okay. Would you be OK? So um, Harvard College class of 2021, 2021 and, and uh, Andover class of 2017. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I believe I've spoken after Devante before at an Andover event. And it's always very daunting, but I'm lucky to be able to do it here. So um, after, reading, um, after reading Safe Spaces, Brave Spaces, I came away from the book, I think, with one impression, well, with many impressions, but one dominant one. And that was from experiences I've had, I've understood that um, 
they're definitely not mutually exclusive, and I think brave spaces are often built from safe spaces. And I've seen this in a lot of my um, own personal experiences. For example, I did Scholastic Bowl in high school at Andover. We had a lovely team that would go and do academic competitions. But the thing that I noticed about it very quickly was that it was very gender imbalanced. There were very few women. Mm -hmm. um, I think at one point it was probably the only female captain in the region. And there was a lot of outright misogyny that would take place. So I think we started off by building a, a Facebook group, right, where we'd all share our experiences. It was just for female members of Quiz Bowl teams. And um, from that, we'd refine our ideas and talk about the things that we'd experienced. And those would turn into plans, like an action plan. We ended up making a competition um, that would focus upon female achievements in academia. And so eventually that turned into a group wherein people of all genders were invited to talk about things that they had noticed within the field of academic competition and the sexism that often is engendered there. So that was a brave space, of course. I think according to Mr. Mr. Palfrey's definition, we could understand that as a brave space wherein everybody's welcome to bring up controversial points, but everybody's also very engaged in discussing those points and coming to a greater understanding of what's at play, but that came from a safe space. Also, responding to one of Devante's points about rule setting across, um, across schools, I think one thing that I've seen on the micro level in my own few months here at Harvard as a freshman is um, rule setting in small groups. So we often begin a discussion by saying, well, are there, this is, we'd like to create a safe space where everyone feels safe bringing forth their own personal experiences without fearing that they'll be judged. How can we do this? And we're often asked to come up with rules, which, which can be a really daunting thing, I think wondering how we can really make ourselves feel that we can say what we feel without being judged or wondering if someone's going to talk about us later. It's something that we've said being offensive. And so I guess I would be interested to know and how other people here in this, in this group would think about the rules that we can establish in small groups just so that we can mm -hmm. express ourselves mm -hmm. because that can be a, a very interesting task. Piper, thank you, as always. Super insightful and, and interesting. I look forward to hearing some student reactions to that. One brief note I would make is, I think you're exactly right that the, the brave spaces and safe spaces idea is truly just a heuristic. There are, you know, there's obviously uh, much in between those, and I think you're right that they build upon one another. Uh, I do think that giving uh, students a sense of safety from which they can be brave is actually a really, really important a way to think about it as well, which is that we um, we do experience environments very differently, and we might experience them even differently over time. In in could be in a relatively short period of time. And as educators, I think we want students to be able to experience the discomfort from which they grow. But sometimes we really need to ground that in a sense of safety. So I think it's really an important important insight. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to bring another mic, or grab that one actually for a sec, um, over to Tan V. And since we're on uh, a live stream, I probably won't use your last name since you're a current Andover student, but um, uh, class of 2019 yes. at uh, Phillips Academy. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And yes, my name is Tan V, as Mr. Poffer mentioned. And um, one thing I would say is different from my experience than Devante and Piper had mentioned is that I have not spent a lot of time outside of a secondary school institution. I've not spent a lot of time in a college such as Harvard. I've spent most of my time in Andover or in other, or most of my time thinking about these issues critically within Andover and the scope of Andover. And um, one thing that I think in reading Safe Spaces and Brave Spaces that really stuck out to me was this idea of the reason why diversity exists and the reason why, diverse, or why diversity is helpful in these institutions, at least from the perspective of a Supreme Court case level. And, they, and one of the things that has been said was that this idea of cross-pollination of ideas that, uh, that people on different sides of the spectrum get to hear from different experiences. But from my experience, um, a, lot of that, a lot of that has not really occurred because we've kind of stuck in our own groups. Um, people who are kind of radical liberal um, or think of themselves as like on the far left end of the spectrum kind of tend to stick towards those those people and don't really engage in that um, cross-pollination of ideas. And I guess one of the questions I would ask mm. is on an institutional level, how do you um, enact policies or commit to certain ideas that would allow students to, um, to have that cross-pollination of ideas? And um, I think the other thing that I came away from this book thinking about was, um, yes, there's this polarization of, um, 
of free speech and diversity. But then another thing that I thought about was also like there's this polarization between um, the institution and um, the adults and teachers working in the institution mm -hmm. as well as um, the student and the student protesters. There's this kind of like thought about as this unsurmountable divide. And I guess, um, and I think the perception of a lot of student activists is that they're kind of like going through a phase. They're doing something, you know, just for the sake of doing it in college, and then when they leave, mm. they'll enter the real world. And I think another question I would ask is, how do we, how do we bridge that gap, and how do we um, commit to to kind of taking down that perception of student activists and commit to taking them more seriously in this environment? It's a great point, and I'd love to. We should catalog these questions and then come back to it and hear hear other views. But let me try these two, and then and then we'll uh, hopefully open it back up. Um, I think the first one about how do we encourage more cross pollinization, as you say, of ideas and and students engaging them is a really hard problem for all of us as educators, and should be a problem for you as students, right? It, it, I, put this back to you to some degree. Um, one thing I've been struck by, the difference between teaching in this exact room at Harvard Law School and teaching uh, at Andover, is there is a much higher degree of comfort in the Harvard Law School setting of disagreeing across political boundaries that I've experienced, and that um, the, uh, the range of political views that have seemed uh, sort of acceptable in the classroom is much broader. In the context of Andover, it has been much more there are various degrees of how far on the left you are, but it's all within a relatively modest band. And in fact, at least in the context of the classrooms I've observed and some of the political conversations, um, I think it's been hard to be outside of a certain orthodoxy. So one thing I have encouraged students to do in my own classes and, and otherwise is respectfully to try to find ways to disagree and to have a conversation to advance the truth around the edges. And I've said to students in my class, if you write a paper that I disagree with totally, but it's a beautifully written paper. It's a great argument. You've got great evidence as an historian. You're going to get a great grade on that. You might even get a better, you actually will get a better grade than if I think you were just parroting back to me my sort of general left of center Massachusetts liberal viewpoint that you properly have assessed as my point of view. Um, so I think that is actually really important for us to engage that and to, and to, um, and to live it ultimately. Your second point about taking campus activists seriously is a really good one. So I open the book, and I've, I've written in other places about this. I think the kind of mainstream media view of students as crybabies and snowflakes and all those kinds of things, cry bullies is another variant of it, I think is stupid. I think it is, it, it, that is taking um, and kind of reducing to caricature today's students. And actually part of what I urge in this book is to take more seriously the kinds of concerns the students are raising. Students sometimes take it too far when they start shutting down other kinds of speech, absolutely. Um, but I actually think one of the things that we do need to do is to say this is part of the, an important um, set of messages from a generation to another generation. We need to take it very seriously. I think, and I'd be interested in those who are older and their reactions, part of what's gone on that's really interesting is that the people who are now running institutions uh, like uh, like this one and, and, and other elite institutions, generally speaking, I think many of them kind of grew up in the 1960s and 70s at times when they thought of themselves as the reformers. They may have sat in, they may have marched on Washington, they may have done things that they felt like they were the reformers. And now all of a sudden, they're being criticized by students and they can't figure out what's going on. I think there is an interesting historical dynamic, intergenerational dynamic that's playing out right now, which is affecting, I think, how people see one another. And I think you, you press on that really nicely. Dunby, thank you. That's great. Over to Albert, also a current Andover student, but the class of 18. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm currently a four-year senior at Phillips Academy. And um, I actually had the privilege of uh, having Mr. Palfer's to the launch last year um, in our US history course for the whole year. and. Um, I could see really embodying values you brought up in this book, um, like for example, in uh, actively encouraging students to to put forward diametrically opposing opinions uh, with the, uh, f with you and with each other. Thank you. I'm glad that came through. Yeah, <laughs> that's a relief. <laughs> it's your big chance with a microphone. You can say uh -huh. anything you want about your head okay. of school, right? Yeah, but um, so. I noticed that one reason we were able to do that was that our history class was actually not at all lecture based. We mm -hmm. had we did our reading assignments and it was more seminar based. But then not all ed uh, secondary educational institutions have a group of students capable enough of doing that. So I wonder what, what would be your take on the um, generalization and universalization of the ideals you brought up, in, brought, you put forth 
in this book. So for example, wouldn't, uh, for, for, uh, for instance, for high schools, um, the kids at this age are, some, some of them are not, uh, are still in trying to formulate their own value theories and their understanding of the world. And shouldn't the, uh, so how would you strike the balance between liberalization and guidance as to mm -hmm. teach people what to do and encouraging them to think freely? How would you strike the balance of that? That's my second question. And then my third would be, so wouldn't, uh, at this level, wouldn't more potentially encouraging more ideas um, cre create um, s sort of um, schisms or tensions that among the, the community, even though it's a safe space and brave space, how would you, for example, in reinforce a sort of a kind of type of school identity or communi com communal identity <coughs> and unity among the student body? Thank you. Lots, lots to unpack there. And in fact, I, I hear some echoes of Devante's point about the kinds of values that ought to maybe be a baseline and from which you would be building. Um, and I will just do a broad answer to your three questions and then maybe, again, we'll come back to it in, in, the, in the discussion. I feel like the, the essential point in response to what you're saying is that we should allow, in the case of students, particularly age 14 to 18 in the context of high school or for 18 to 22 or whatever in, in college and, and in law school after that, Students need to be exploring ideas on their own. And in fact, I think that's part of why I'm so insistent on having both a combination of comfort and discomfort. I think if all it is is received wisdom, in other words, there are fabulous professors who are lecturing, but in fact, not much engagement with that, I think that's ultimately not a fantastic form of learning and, and engagement. I totally get that having a high school that has the kind of resources that Endeavor has doesn't scale particularly well. Last year, the class you're referring to, we had, I don't know, 12 or 13 students and two faculty members, right? That doesn't work economically for most of the world. Um, so I, I realize we're in kind of rarefied air in that way. Um, but I think, I think figuring out a way that there is a dialectic, that there is an engagement with students where they are trying on ideas and having them, in fact, subjected and to, to commentary and, and critique, I don't think there's anything better than that in a way in, in terms of learning. Um, to your sort of third, third part of your question in a way, I, and this is where I think it connects up so well to Devante's question is, I think we have to communicate values. And I actually think one of the things that is most bizarre about this moment, and as Urs said earlier, this the moment feels very dislocated, and it does for me in, in historical terms in some ways, um, is that there's such a challenge against institutions. Um, and I actually think there's a huge place for institutions at this moment, and institutions that do express their values really, really clearly. So just to take in the end of our context, we talk about youth from every quarter, the idea that we bring students from all around the world to a particular high school because we believe in diversity in an equity and inclusion in a particular way, I think there needs to be some top-down communication of those values, whether that's in a lecture hall or that's in a class or that's in discussion. It's not to say you can't press against it. It's not to say you shouldn't challenge it and how it's played out because I think from that truth will come. But I think conveying some values of the institution is really important to do. I think Devante has the appropriate counter to that, which is to say, yes, but shouldn't there be a limit on the outside boundaries of that? I'm putting words in your mouth. But my sense is that this gets at one of the hardest problems at the core of this topic, which is to what extent do we have to tolerate the intolerance? And if an institution happens to have really intolerant values, do we welcome that in our community? I think that's where that, that uh, argument finds the, the hardest, the hardest uh, counter challenge. So thank you. Maybe over to Ziza Banasi, class of 2021 at Harvard and 2017 at Phelps Academy. Thank you, Mr. Palfrey. Good evening, everybody. My name is Abdul Aziz Nasr Behnesi. Uh, I go by Zizo in most cases. Uh, so yeah, I'm a recent graduate of Andover and a first year student at Harvard, so I'm learning as much as I can, uh, essentially. Okay, so I am an Egyptian American student from North Plainfield, New Jersey. I was born in 1999 after my parents immigrated a year and a half earlier. And I bring up that particular set of dates because I, along with everybody else on this panel, have grown up in a very different age than I assume most of you did. We have access to the internet, for example, right? An eight-year-old child who is browsing Facebook, watching videos uh, of his favorite cartoon, might encounter political comments, might encounter comments that, uh, that actually you would not necessarily want to show an eight-year-old child. Or uh, an eight-year-old child is looking for something fun to do, but they end up encountering this conversation that they don't necessarily know how to respond to. Now, I just bring that up in case you have any further connections uh, within the next few minutes. But um, I guess my question at the end of the day is, 
what happens when what is assumed to be uh, a common safe space, what is supposed to be somebody's safe space, ultimately becomes a brave space for one person and not for the other. Mm. So say you're in a dorm at Andover. I'm not going to name my particular dorm, but <laughs> it, was, uh, it was very much victim to this kind of problem. You have students who, um, who assume this space is their own. They speak freely. Like you said, this is their kitchen. They assume they can say what they want without any sort of correction or necessary response. They don't want a political conversation. They want to hang out with their friends and develop this personal relationship. What happens when those default values, what people have accepted as the standard and as uh, what a community needs to build, uh, overrides what somebody else views as comfortable and uh, overrides what those other students view as what they need? Uh, and so ultimately, this question is one about what the actual power of an institution is to develop that community, what the power of an institution is uh, to monitor and to perhaps mold a little bit how people actually feel. I was reading a piece for my expository writing class recently, which is a wonderful Harvard freshman course. Expos, out of uh, Yeah, and this is a course called Terrorism or Freedom Fighter, and we read a theory by uh, Irving Janis called Groupthink. Groupthink is a situation in which students uh, in this context, or human beings uh, just potentially and in general, default to a common set of ideas because they feel either comfortable psychologically and they want to fit in, because another perspective would cause them to expend extra energy, uh, and they might not have that energy to expend at any given moment, or they don't have uh, the benefit of having another perspective brought in, which is why diversity is super important and why we should have safe spaces so people can uh, ultimately build their benchmarks intellectually. Um, but when you have communities that have this group think in dorms, for example, or on the internet when uh, people are self-selecting and viewing what they want to view, how in the world can an institution actually uh, construct safe spaces when some safe spaces override others and create brave spaces? It's a fantastic point. I, I do not have an easy answer to this one, so I'd be interested in somebody having a better answer than, than my initial thought. Um, one is really, just as you suggested, is, is to think about these spaces as experienced by different people in different ways. And when you're coming up with a rule set, to ensure that there is support for, for all students and noting that, that these, these contexts will change. I think in some ways, the best learning that I've ever had in my life anyway are late night bowl sessions in a dorm, whether it's at a college or a, at, a, at, a, at a boarding school. Um, and figuring out how to make those spaces ones that are as constructive as possible, I think is one of the very highest uh, jobs that I have as a head of school. Um, but I also think that there need to be protections in case, in case things uh, either leave that context. And I think the spread of the internet and, the, and of social media, which can take a very small sound bite that was in a very proper safe space and can share it in a very different context on the, on the web can be very dangerous, um, as well as the fact that I think we are learning that people who have been marginalized in these communities are reacting quite differently to these environments than those whose families have traditionally been there. And saying both of those things put a good challenge on, on this rule set. So thank you for raising it. It's excellent. Miriam, if you would take up the mic, that'd be awesome. And class of 2018 at Andover. Hi, I'm Miriam. Um, I thought a lot when reading your book about the through line you pose of forms and how we should have different mm -hmm. guidelines for forms of different sizes. And I think that Andover in particular is very lucky to have forms of very different scales. We have things as small as hallways, which might be six girls mm. to the dorm, which might be 30 to a club, which might be 15 in your cluster, which is a sort of neighborhood system that we have at our school. And as someone who's worked in student government and residential life, we get kind of our pick of the lot when we sit down to intentionally have these conversations. We can decide, is this a conversation we want people to have in their hallway? Is it something we want to happen in a classroom or at an all-school meeting when everyone is there? Um, my question to you then would be for communities like maybe a more traditional public high school mm -hmm. where you might only have a 30-person classroom as your community standard forum size scale mix of people, how do we have the more difficult conversations that a community like Andover might choose to have in a much more intimate setting? It's a great question. And again, I'm always aware that in, in well-off institutions, we can do things that really help uh, by virtue of that, so not everything is, is universal. I think you've had an insight, though, Miriam, as a student leader that not everyone has had, which is in the context of these hard discussions, 
what size the group has and, and what the rule set is for that matters enormously. And as you suggest, having 1,100 people in a, uh, in a, a public space is very different than, than breaking it down. What I would suggest in the case of a 30-person public high school setting, you still can break down into groups of two or three or four, right? There's nothing, I think, that stops a teacher, and maybe there are rules somewhere in the country in public high schools, but that say you always must be lecturing from the front of the room to 30 students, right? Um, I always think it's that your one is able to break down the discussion and to make it more intimate in that ways or to, to change things up. So um, I, think the, I think the answer is to try to figure out how do you hack the space and how do you, how do you figure out to, how to bring these insights to bear in any, any given classroom. Um, that's not to say there aren't huge Huge challenges to uh, to the signs of scale and time and the pressures that a high school teacher might have who's teaching to a test and doesn't really feel like they can afford that kind of time. There are other kinds of pressures I think that are put on it, um, but I think your your essential insight, which is often two people or three or four people have a very different conversation than just standing up in front of this or doing it when you're being recorded for posterity. How different this is, knowing that if I say something really, really dumb, it could be the end of my academic career. That's a really, really interesting insight, right? Um, and, and an important one, I think, um, and one that probably wouldn't have been something anyone would say even you know, a couple of generations ago. Thank you. Last of the student commenters, Darius Lamb, so class I'm of 2021. I'm going to saying something dumb here. <laughs> I don't know, four um, weeks into Harvard College, maybe yeah. you should save that for a little later. But. Uh, so my name's Darius. I am a freshman at Harvard um, in the same class as Piper and Zizo, and I really actually wanted to draw upon both of their points um, that they made. The first one had to do with sort of the idea of a safe space. And I think if we define a safe space as a place where people can um, you know, go without fear of being judged and talk about what they want to say and have those words be, you know, within this community, I think before the era of safe spaces, we might just call them like friends, right? People <laughs> who, who we can talk to um, and trust that our words would be kept private without fear of judgment. So in the sense that that is what a safe space is, I think it's a great idea. The issue that I see arises when there's um, a strive towards an institutionalization of like safe spaces and a mis mm. uh, like misdefinition, I guess, of, of what a safe space is. One example, um, when I was at Andover, there was a speaker, um, a female entrepreneur, uh, you know, very prominent to come. And the event, I, I remember I was, you know, just in the maker space at, at Phillips Academy, you know, minding my own business. And I heard there was this event here. And I was like, okay, you know, why don't, why don't I just check it out? Turns out the event was uh, female only, uh, a safe space for females. Oh. Um, I guess to discuss like business or something. Um, I wasn't particularly sure what it was, but that sort of event struck with me because it seemed to be uh, something that was exclusionary. Uh, another more subtle example would be if, for example, it's a space for only um, a certain like culture of students mm -hmm. and another person who is not of that culture decides to sit in. Should that person be allowed, um, even if that person is not contributing? Oftentimes it there can be like a chilling effect on the other individuals in the room that somebody out like that's different from them is there. But I think that tension of having somebody that's different from you being there, having a chilling effect on your speech is something that is um, really important to like dissect and figure out why that's happening um, as opposed to just separating it out. The other thing I wanted to mention is a, a lot of my work recently has been around like technology and AI and stuff and I want to um, bring up the idea of action plans, and I think that was brought up before as um, sort of galvanized by social media. I think on the one hand, as we've seen th through like democracy movements around the world, like the ability to get together in, in large groups and, and act is, is really powerful and really important. But I also think it does lower the threshold be mm. between um, thoughts and words and then words and actions. And that sort of um, lowering, that sort of like joining of the, the distinction between those three categories is something important and that we, we have to really um, think about, especially as uh, you know, a lot of people in our generation want to act more and ha like do things, right? They, they don't want to just talk, they want to act and, and what that means for, for society. So. It's very impressive. Thank you, as always. And, and you, like your fellow students, have this amazing way of honing in on something that really, really matters. And I, I love your first point about 
safe spaces as being like friends, which is awfully nice. Um, I want to have the uh, leave for the group maybe a discussion of this idea of excluding some in order to include some more, which of course is a, a challenging tension in diversity work. The conversation is often around affinity groups, right? So um, can and should you have, for instance, um, we have a, a group on our campus, the Sisterhood, which is for uh, women of color in particular. That group, if, if I were to show up, I would not be welcome in that group. Um, and for a variety of reasons, we think that's a positive thing for Andover to offer. But to your point, someone is included. In fact, most of the school is excluded from that. And is that a necessary part of inclusion? So I think that tension is one we should definitely surface. And thank you for bringing AI into the conversation. So maybe some of the Berkman people who are here who um, have very strong and uh, quite informed views on that can, can comment. Um, so if I might, I will open it back up to uh, to the, the larger group. And we also may have some people tweeting in. I know at least one uh, HLS faculty member is watching from afar and might, might tweet something in. So we'll keep an eye out. Um, but the floor is open. Mr. Fisher. A typically fascinating presentation. Thank you. I wanted to... Um, Explore a little bit your frequent references in the presentation here to rule sets. Let's imagine this um, is the first of a series of classes. That's right. And one is trying to shape a balance between the values that you identify. You could do it by announcing some rules in advance. It could be Shadow house rules could be no racial epithets, could be no ad hominem attacks. These are getting a little bit softer, but mm -hmm. your rules. Another possibility is for you, the organizer of the space, to announce a set of values at the outset. Say, we adhere to the general principle of respect. Uh, we want each of you to, when responding to your colleagues, to take the best versions of their arguments, not the worst versions. Okay. So that would be articulating values. And the third possibility is to um, not say anything at the beginning, but model through your behavior how you respond overtly to students' engagement. and the subtle signals any teacher gives of scowls and puzzles <laughs> and are you sending, okay. When we went to school, I'm including you in this. Yes, yes, we are generationally attached, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> there were no rules in classrooms like that. I never heard of any rules. And it was very rare for somebody at the outset to announce a set of principles. But that's not to say there weren't efforts to shape an environment, but it was all done in the third way. It was modeling. Uh, now, things went wrong with the modeling, uh, among other things, you know, the becoming gentleman idea, the gender bias, it was all built through modeling and what it meant to be engaged and responsive, when one should interrupt and not interrupt, those are all gendered. So there were problems in the transmission through modeling. But there are also things that worked in the right hands beautifully. beautifully. My experience of you, one of the things that makes you a wonderful teacher, is you convey values through modeling really well. Now, it doesn't surprise me that so many of your former students are here and in their um, precision and grace and openness engage these issues. And I think this is likely connected to the way you taught them. So against that backdrop, I'm uneasy about the ironic, from this standpoint, mm inclination to develop rule sets. Um, they may be necessary as a prophylactic to overcome some of the biases in the older system. But I doubt their effectiveness 
long term. I have an intuition that the best hope for the future in this increasingly troubled educational as well as global environment is people embodying and conveying in the old method better values. Well, so students, current and former of Phillips Academy, what you have just observed <laughs> an extraordinarily hard question, but also a dynamic that you don't know, which I will unveil to you, which is just as I have been your teacher, this was my teacher. So in Terry Fisher, the person who taught me, well, anyway, a lot. Um, and an incredibly hard question. So uh, thank you for the compliments uh, that uh, make the question yet harder. Um, I would say my own thinking of it, but this is incredibly tentative and wishing, as always with your questions, that I have more time to think about it, which I will, um, is that something like two, then one, then three in terms of your possibilities. So the conveying of values of the institution seems to me essential. The conveying, and in the case of Andover, it's straightforward for me because I, uh, that's what I do as the head of schools. I try to talk about youth from every quarter, the idea of non-sibi or not for self, the idea that we must combine knowledge with goodness, um, and so forth, which are a series of values that I think are the ones that ground our decisions in all of these different ways. Um, you have pressed hard on number one, the rule sets. I think of the rules as deriving from those values informed, of course, by the background law. So I will um, stick for a moment with the rules around um, gender-based violence. So in that case, I think our values tell us something about the fact that we wish to have an environment in which there should be no gender-based violence, but also that we deconstruct a world of toxic masculinity which we receive over a period of time. And we are informed by the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which has rules about hazing, harassment, and bullying. And therefore, we must craft a rule set that, that uh, responds to that. We also are informed by the federal law, shifting over time, unfortunately, um, led in a very positive way by your wife to, to your left um, at one point in history, and maybe shifting the other way at the moment, but informed clearly by these things. And we must have, I think, reasonable rules. I take this as an example because I think it's one of the areas where there are restrictions on speech that are appropriate and are grounded both in law and rules and at, at our school. Um, and I think you're right, though, that number three is the most powerful, honestly. I think the modeling idea is most important. Um, I take no credit, by the way, for the effect on these particular students informed by lots of other uh, teachers. Um, but I do think that's in essence, or no, at its core, the most important thing is that we teach and lead through, uh, through effective modeling. And back at you. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, well, I'm very happy to see how well the admissions committee has done its work. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, everybody. Uh, I've been at Harvard for, I guess, about 70 years now. And one of the things I noticed, I was a freshman advisor and then a Radcliffe Dean, let's say from the late 50s to the middle 60s, and then Eric Erickson's head section man, as we used to say. Dorothy, can you say a little more about Eric Erickson? Because this name may be known very well to some of us, but maybe not well, quite I as well. I was just going to start there about the importance of an individual in changing what's going on. Uh, there was a period at Harvard when a man by the name of McGeorge Bundy, uh, who then left Harvard, went to Washington to become an advisor to the president, had an idea that he should bring 12 people to Harvard who didn't have traditional backgrounds. David Reisman and Eric Erickson were among them. Eric did not have a college degree. Full professor, university professor, and no college degree. It was a totally different era. I realized in all the things that these wonderful young people said, none of the freshmen I spoke to then ever mentioned any of them. That these ideas have a time, and one has to understand that time. Erickson had been a disciple of Freud's. 
He was actually an artist who was doing the paintings of Anna Freud's children in Vienna. And he just looked at this university in a totally different way. And he, the course was called The Life Cycle, or as we called it, The Life Cycle. And <laughs> every student wrote a term paper on Catcher in the Rye. That was the book that every Harvard senior was reading. Now, Erickson gave these lectures. They were brilliant. And I finally said to him one day, look, these are brilliant lectures, but they're based on a male model. What you see are brilliant young people coming here. They grow, they develop, they move on. They have these great careers. And it's a lineal expression. It has nothing to do with the young women I'm seeing who are Radcliffe freshmen. And he looked at me and he said, so you do it. Meaning, you think that's such a big thing? Write the lectures and you can mm. give them. That again is the power of the individual. No more traditional Harvard professor would have turned to a graduate student and said, you do it. Do you do it, Dorothy? Of course. That way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we'll talk about it sometime. Excellent. Like that, That's so good. That's okay. Thank uh, you. But whatever, I don't want people to feel that they have to be overly well formulated ideas mm -hmm. to give you expression to your values. On forming groups, I think there's nothing like closing the door. Mm -hmm. You can sit in each other's rooms, close the door, and you can change it. And I worry, as I listen to some of this, uh, of too much being formed and not enough of people sort of being able just to let go and try a lot of ideas. And you know, I'm so old now, I have my ideas. Nobody's <laughs> going to change anything I believe in now. But I think you kids really have a way to think through, do I want to be part of the group? Is there another way of looking at this? And how do I incorporate? You are having incredible interpersonal experiences at this time of your life. How do you incorporate those into the values you're now trying to delineate? Totally wonderful. Thank you, Dorothy. That's great. Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much for, for writing the book and for making it available um, like openly. And for your students, I think that those were those those interactions were really excellent and quite brilliant. Um, my name is Hannah Mukhayer, and I am a PhD student at the Faculty of Law at the University of Cambridge. I trace my descent from a, a Hamilton high in North Edward. And I I emphasize that because I feel the boundaries of Sudan as it currently exists do not define me. Um, but since I am here, I wanted to ask, how do you create create safe and brave spaces in spaces that are inherently exclusionary, mm. right? How do you acknowledge those who are excluded even in the safest or bravest of spaces? So for example, how do we acknowledge the Native American tribes on whose land kind of this institution is built or the slave laborers whose work was put into building these institutions? Mm -hmm. So how, who bears the responsibilities that an individual responsibility or a collective responsibility, or is it just depends on who happens to be in a space? Mm. Right? How do we kind of create this environment where these things can arise organically or maybe even forced to arise? It's a wonderful question, and I think the answer is we all have that obligation. And, and in fact, uh, I think that there are some great examples from close by where it's been done well, and I think there are lots of examples that we can point to where it's been done quite poorly. Um, I think that the symbolism of the plaque that was put out on, is it Cumble Plaza at the law school, is a positive one in terms of uh, the acknowledgment of some of that slave labor that created, in fact, this, this law school. The, for those who don't know, the royal chair, which was the first chair in law, which basically became the money for the law school, I think we need to acknowledge that. Um, I credit uh, several of the professors in the last few years um, who have spent a lot of time thinking about how to redo the Harvard Law School shield. I think that's, again, symbolic. 
public but important. It was done through conversation. I love also that there were dissenting views on that committee and published um, another perspective in terms of how that, that came about. And um, I give huge credit for that, that process. It's just an example from right here. Um, but I agree with you. I think one of the things that I've always struggled with is how to think about the Native peoples and the fact that this is land that they had, to the extent anyone can own land, period, um, before uh, those who started this college did or, or the school that I work at now. And um, I, don't have an, I do not have an easy answer to that other than that I think it is all of our obligation and that, that um, I think that when we think about diversity and equity and inclusion, that it is, it's an ongoing task that I think is more of a verb than a noun and something that we're going to have to keep, um, keep at for a very, very long time. And I think what you point at with those two examples of, uh, in some respects, some of the hardest cases, we need just to rem remember that maybe there are cases we're not even thinking about in terms of people when they come uh, to an environment like this that has been comfortable for someone like me in, in terms of its setup. Um, is We have to be thinking about what, what who are we not including as well. Um, my mom works a lot on, for instance, on uh, people who have various forms of physical disability. Are we as welcoming in these spaces um, for them as we ought to be, as an example? I often wonder at Andover, are we doing enough in that respect? Um, so I think there are lots of ways to think about uh, marginalization and how we act more inclusively than we do. And my hunch is that we're a generation away from feeling actually good about what we're doing. I hope, I hope directionally, when you all are um, university professors or administrators, that you'll, you'll have uh, figured it out better than, than we all have. But it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who's spoken. It's been spectacular already. When you spoke about safe spaces, you gave the example of a kitchen, which is such a great example. We can all, I hope, imagine a kitchen uh, in which we have had that wonderful feeling of being among loved ones and people who won't, uh, I can't say won't judge us. Of course they'll. They're, yes, we all judge. Of course they no judge question. us. <laughs> but Maybe worse than others. Terribly yeah, yeah. ferocious way. Yeah. The thing about the kitchen, though, is that it's not established or um, protected by any institution or any authority. On the mm -hmm. contrary, it is it is um, uh, set up, and its atmosphere is created and maintained by the people who are in it, and only those people. Um, what difference does it make then? when safe spaces are created and maintained and their rules are established and, and defended by an institution. Mm. That seems to be a pretty new idea. And do you think, therefore, that there should be safe spaces that are privately set up and maintained and also safe spaces that are set up and maintained by institutions? And then finally, um, should some of those spaces be permitted to exclude people and others hmm. not? And is the bifurcation between institutionally set up safe spaces and not institutionally set up ones? It's a lovely set of questions. I have a ton of views on this, but I actually have not let any of the students answer any of the questions. So I don't know if any of you would like to answer, reply to this question. Should there be institutionally set up as opposed to or in addition to privately set up safe spaces? I can try. I can try. Uh, I think this is also kind of similar to what I was thinking when I was asking my question as well. What I do think an institution can do in terms of establishing these safe spaces on one extremely high level is building a critical mass of students in any given uh, identity, right? So at Andover, this was a problem we had as Muslim students. There weren't very many Muslim students on campus. It was very hard to have those particular safe spaces when you had 12 other people on campus who were of the same faith and only one or two of whom uh, were close to you, right? Uh, so building that critical mass for sure. Then this idea of actually constructing safe spaces as an institution, uh, which actually manifested on our campus through the uh, through our CAMD is what we called it. It's basically the Office of Multicultural um, Development and Community <laughs> Development, excuse me. Um, and that does have a lot of power when you have students who are coming in and unsure of whether or not this institution is going to be their home. That kind of, uh, this construction that an institution can provide is one that has the reflection of people who have been in the environment previously and also allows uh, all that planning through 
whatever goes into developing a center like CAMD to uh, try to hone in on an individual's experience from the start. So yes, it is a very new experience, but um, can those safe spaces supplement and actually substitute for the safe spaces people create with their friends, the safe spaces people would create in their kitchen? Uh, I'm not entirely certain, and so I do think the biggest role of the institution is to, to build those critical masses in any given capacity, which is why I'm very much supportive of diversity. That's so good. Cesar, do you think that affinity groups of the sort that Darius at least obliquely criticized have a place in, uh, in, a, in a school or a university? In other words, an affinity group which would be exclusionary. In other words, might be, let's say it's just to take that example, those of Muslim faith are welcome in this room, but the doors then going to be closed to those of other faiths. Uh, so, to be totally frank, yes, I do think they have a place in a lot of institutions. And I'll explain a little bit. So, uh, I mentioned earlier something I briefly mentioned was intellectual benchmarks. Uh, and when I say intellectual benchmarks, I'm referring to the contributions of another voice when you have discourse. So in the ideal world, you have a statement that warrants a response, and that response warrants another response. And through that dialogue and through that discourse, you direct the conversation towards some kind of truth, or at least some understanding of the truth. That idea begins to fade and collapse when the other voice is either excluded or not even there, or uh, marginalized to a degree uh, at which that voice does not want to speak up. Now, how do you counter that marginalization or that fading of the voice? I think it is by allowing students to come together and think about what they value uh, without fear of criticism, without fear of somebody determining whether or not they're right. And so that is the role a safe space or an affinity group would play. It develops somebody's hands-on intellectual benchmarks. If I were to step back and actually apply this to something bigger and less personal, we could say this dichotomy of brave spaces and safe spaces uh, or affinity groups on the safe space side applies uh, to cultures as well. So say Arab culture, it's kind of touchy sometimes, right? Like you kiss each other on the cheek. It's a wonderful experience. Say you are in an environment That's that by default... That's not the touchy I thought you had in mind. That's interesting. <laughs> no, <laughs> different touchy, different touchy. But say the default, cult default culture at a place um, in America, for example, is uh, determined determines the value of touching by the amount of germs in the air. So touching isn't good. But at the same time, you have this entire culture of people that love it. So you're judging an entire culture, an entire sect, based on the, the guidelines of one set of, uh, of people. And so when somebody comes in from the Arab culture and goes into this new culture, they're not going to express that idea. And in fact, if you don't have that outside culture, if you don't have a space where that culture can manifest, in Egypt, for example, then it will never nurture. And so uh, if you translate that and try to bring it to a sentimental level and the actual human beings and students involved, if you allow students to develop what they think, if you do, uh, allow students to develop what they feel and uh, to try to bring that to some concise statement uh, with people they feel comfortable with, then you can actually uh, contribute to those brave spaces and that dialogue that we mentioned earlier. Cesar, thank you. We have time for one more. Is it okay, Alba? Um, Mark. Yeah. Thanks. I'm Mark Baker. I'm the head of the Jewish high school that uh, you alluded to earlier. And where did you go for uh, high school, Mark? And I'm a proud alum of uh, Phillips Academy Andover. Thank you. We did very well with that. 1993. I'm not sure where that puts me generationally, yeah, yeah. but I think, it's, I think I'm with you um, and Yale alum. So um, that puts me a little on the out. So I'm feeling both uh, inside and outside yeah. right now. Um, I just wanted to um, point out um, that this has been, first of all, this is great and very important work, and I think feels very relevant to the work that we're doing. And I, I would say, speaking from a, a religious school, since you brought it up uh, in, in many ways, we are struggling with the same things, and even though we do it in a particular cultural language, so there may be some nuances, I'm not sure it's so different. Mm -hmm. um, although I would say being in a liberal religious environment, such yes. as a pluralistic Jewish high school, would be different than being in a more, let's say, orthodox mm -hmm. religious environment, where really the game may be as different as you alluded to. Um, but one thing that hasn't come up yet, I think, is the issue of social-emotional learning. Mm -hmm and the degree to which to navigate the incredibly sensitive balance that you're talking about isn't actually an intellectual exercise, and it's not a political exercise. It actually requires tremendous self-management, self-knowledge. I think it requires, uh, it's the work of the heart. 
Um, and I think all of our institutions, if we think of this only as a rational intellectual effort to create a new kind of cognitive language for this very nuanced work and don't tend to the hearts um, of our students and really start being explicit about the habits of mind and habits of heart that we need to develop in people such that they can navigate these very sensitive waters. I worry that we're gonna have lots of rules and lots of boundaries and even wonderful aspirational cultures that only those who have naturally developed in that way are able to navigate. Um, so the thing that I'm wondering about as we're talking is what does it take, first of all, to develop leaders and those leaders could be explicit institutional positional leaders or the kind of student who, when you do close that door, can actually turn a hard conversation mm. into a generative one. Um, what to develop leaders who can, who can help create these kinds of balanced, safe and brave spaces, but also what would it look like to really take on in our universities and certainly in our high schools um, the work of social emotional development for our students and not assume that they're just gonna pick that up even if we model it. It's wonderful, thank you. And, uh, Having visited Gann Academy, I'm quite confident that that's just what you and Frank are doing there. So thank you for leading the way. And I do think that in the, in the panel of students that have spoken tonight, you see, I think, some great social emotional learning in terms of what, what they've done. And, and I think that the, the, the range of, uh, of approaches that you've brought are, are ones because I think you have done that kind of, that kind of learning uh, in school. Um, I did the very first talk about this a couple of days ago for our parents weekend. And I got some really interesting and hard questions from, from our, our current parents. And the last question that came up was one actually about um, if a student at our school had um, uh, at some point become uh, someone who had some abhorrent views. In this case, they used the example of someone become a neo-Nazi. Would I expel them? I thought this was a really, really hard question in front of a couple hundred uh, parents. And of course, the answer is yes, I would expel them to the extent that there were actions based on, on that viewpoint, if that were just in the back of their mind, and 10 years later we learn that, I would be embarrassed that that had happened, um, and so forth, but I probably wouldn't expel them for the thoughts that they might be having. We got into how you might, one might think about that. Um, but in some ways, I think it gets at the heart of your question, which is, what are we actually doing as schools? Are we, ideally, the answer is that won't happen. That would, wouldn't happen out of 1,100 students that we have because we're, in fact, teaching them in such a way that the social emotional learning is that they wouldn't come to have those, those abhorrent views. Um, and yet we know in our society, people do have those views. And they are, um, you know, they're in our face in Charlottesville. They're in our face in you know, Gainesville, Florida. They're, they're consistently there. And I think in some ways, what you bring it back to is the project of education, the project of, of these learning environments and how they then relate to our democracy. And I think in some ways, it relates back to Terry Fisher's question about what of, of the various mechanisms we use between values, rule sets, and modeling, how do we use those in a way to produce really extraordinary kids who are going to then lead the way in ways we're super proud of. So thank you for bringing it around to that. Um, it is a little bit after the time we'd set. Um, we are welcoming everyone to join us for um, uh, further conversation. It's the HLS pub, right, um, which is just over here. Um, students still at Andover, no beer. You get the point. Um, <laughs> others may have beer um, or whatever else. Um, but may we please actually just have a, a really big round of applause for our students who are here tonight. Thank you.